Okay, we're going to have a, a prayer to get started. Um, so could we please bow our heads? Please bow our heads. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for another opportunity that we have to share a little bit about country living. Lord, we pray that everyone who hears and for all that we say, that it might be to thy name's honor and glory and that it might be helpful to somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, what we want to uh, talk about, we're talking about successive crop planting. And uh, why do we want to plant seeds at different times? We're going to talk about all of this. We're going to talk about the garden supplies that you need. I have to click. And we, huh? Talking you want about me the to click? Yes. Um, yeah, click. The weather, as we know, the, the weather is a very important subject when you're planting a garden. You don't want to plant the garden too soon or freeze. It doesn't want to be too wet or too cold. The rot, seeds will rot in the ground. You need to get it at just the right time. And we're going to be talking about just the right time for different things. Different crops are for different times. Okay, we're also going to be talking about seeds and how you're going to know what to do. There are seed catalogs, there's the internet, but uh, we'll be giving a little more uh, information about the kinds of seeds that we have found to work the best. And Yes. Um, what you're going to see in these pictures, are most of these pictures from our garden this year, it wasn't an overly good year to plant a garden from weather-wise because it was very cold and very wet. Just down the road here, I stopped at a friend's a couple of days ago and he planted his corn three times this year before it actually came up, it rotted three times. So uh, don't, don't, don't be uh, sorry if, uh, even people have done it for all their life, and he's going to be 80 this year, by the way, he's done it all his life, they still have failures. But it's very important that you have the soil warm enough and you plant it at the right time. Okay, quick. So uh, we're going to start out by talking about strawberries. Now, um, we're going to start with, how, with when you plant strawberries and then how. So when do you plant them? Strawberries should be planted the last week of April or the first week of May, preferably the last week of April. I happen to know quite a bit about growing strawberries. My parents grew them commercially for years when I was growing up. Okay, but what about at the end of April could have snow? Well, that's no problem. They've plant, they put, put in 6,000 plants a year. They put in 1,500 plants a day. And I've seen them planting in snowstorms. You couldn't see anything. In fact, a few years ago, we went on vacation about the 20th of April, which was a little bit early, but it snowed that night. So I, I dug the plants out of the snow, and I planted them in the, in the ground in the snow. When I come back two weeks later, they were doing one, wonderful. So can you just dig up any plant? Does it make any difference, mm -hmm. or does it have to be runners? What, what we do, we take the runners. Don't get the mother plant from the year before. Now, growing strawberries, if you're going to grow every bear, they bear a few berries all season. I'm talking about June-bearing strawberries. This is the better one. Uh, and you'll get one big crop. We put in about 80 plants last year, and we got 96 quarts this year. You can usually figure about a quart per plant on the ideal condition. When you put these, we'll, we'll demonstrate after. That's why I brought the shovel, and I brought a few uh, strawberry plants. Don't put them in this time of the year. They won't do good, but I'll show you how you put them in. But uh, the first year, you got to leave them about 16 inches apart, and you got to leave three and a half to four feet between the rows because they will spread under ideal conditions. And uh, the first year, you pick all the blossoms. Don't let them make any berries the first year because they will make runners and they'll spread. Now, if you keep a crop of two or three years, you can expect the second year about 50% and the third year about 25% of what you get the first year. Why do you have to keep them weeded? Well, it's like everything else. If you don't weed, the, that's the most important thing about growing a garden, I would say. You can grow a garden very simply, very cheaply, without a lot of, a lot of uh, testing in that. I'm not saying it isn't good to test or to have greenhouses. What we're doing here, we grow without any greenhouses, uh, without any hot blades. A lot of this stuff is good. You can prolong your season. I'm not saying that. But if you come to the country and you got nothing and you want to do it cheap, you can do it our way. You got to prepare. The, I will be talking later about preparing the soil. Uh, 
Now, can you just put them like a row right next to another row? No, you've got to leave. How can you do it? You've got to leave three and a half feet between them. We used to, what three, three and, and a half, half feet. feet. That's quite a ways. Well, I would say that because we would run the, We used to run it for a regular tractor to run between the rows of tillets, and they will spread out. They, they'll spread three or four feet wide each one. So. Now, when they're going to start bearing bearing strawberries. Um, what what do you do? How long will they bear strawberries? Uh, about three weeks. And the first week, are they the tiny ones? The first week you get the big ones, but they're not the sweetest. As it progresses, they get smaller, but they get sweeter. So now, uh, when is the most uh, that you pick the most? Uh, usually mid pickings. <laughs> when they grew commercially, we picked. Um, we had pickers in those days. You could you could hire people then. They picked 180 dozen quarts. That's 2,160 bucks off an acre in one picking. So. That's a lot of strawberries. It was the 1st of July, so we didn't supply the stores then. We had told people for years to come on the 1st of July in the holiday, and the people just came on after another, and I sold all but 20 dozen, which I kept for a store to ask us to keep. Now, we know <laughs> with raspberries, you can't... Uh, you can't pick them while they're wet. Is that the same with strawberries? No, you can pick strawberries wet, no problem. They're better if you can pick them dry, but they, they, they keep good if and if they're wet. Uh, raspberries, you can't do that. The raspberries were, were mold. They just don't, you got to have them dry to pick. So we want to talk about what you should plant and when you should plant it. So we're first going to talk about onions. So when should you plant onions? Onions can go in the last week of April or the first week of May, along with peas, lettuce, and radish. Now they can take quite a bit of frost. Are onions onions? I used to think that whatever food it was, that was the only one there was. She wants you to hold it up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, there's many different varieties of everything. Now, we put in multipliers, which is... Um, Multipliers are like garlic, they make cl like, uh, cloves, you put in one, one, one clove and you get many out of it. And we put in enough every year, we save about 10 or 15 of these cloves for plants for the next year. We let them go to um, maturity, and once the tops have died off, then you pick them and you store them where some place where it's dry and where they don't freeze. And then I've heard about sets. What, what is onion sets? Onion sets, you put them in the... Uh, Actually, what they do, they, they take onions that are that size and they break the tops and they dry them at that thing. So you put them in, they come up a lot quicker. You buy them that way? You buy them that way. And hares, what are they? Uh, uh, well, they're little onion plants that they've started. If you want to start your own onion from seed at home, start them in January. It takes about five months to mature an onion. So you got to start them in January. So the hares, what I call hares, so the little plants are big enough to plant in May, or early May. There's also that other one type of onion you were talking yeah, about. The Egyptian onion. The onions. Egyptian we're going to onion. tell you about them uh, later. Okay, what about radishes? When should you start planting radishes? Radish can go in same time. Radish, lettuce, like I said, radish, lettuce, and onion can go in very early. Quick. Okay, now we want to talk about lettuce. And lettuce, as we just heard, can go in the last of April. You would think something delicate like lettuce wouldn't go in until later when the soil is warm. But no, it's just wonderful that we can actually plant things when the soil is still cold. And, and they do germinate and they do start. This head of lettuce was planted at the end of April. And uh, that's how big it is now. I brought the roots and everything so you could see. We've got a whole row of it now. But I just wanted you to see that even without a hot house, without a greenhouse or anything, this is what you can expect from around here if it's done right. Somebody can take that on the home if they want. <laughs> um, yeah, and I used to think, too, that there was one kind of lettuce. But I guess uh, probably everybody else knows that uh, there are many kinds. I personally like the delicate kinds. So butter crunch is the name of, of seeds that are very delicate and they come in roundish kind of heads. Um, another kind that we have right now is called salad bowl. And that, Sal that's, yeah. the, that's the picture you see here. Yes, and salad bowl is so delicate and, and so nice. And uh, so those are tender ones. 
Now Great Lakes is one that will go on into the snow later and it, it is more hardy. It, it's more hardy for growing when the other things won't grow, like say it's a, a dry season or something, Great Lakes will grow, but it's not as tender in your mouth. So, you know, it, there are many varieties of, of lettuce. Um, now, romaine is a darker lettuce, and that's what... Uh, that, that's a romaine-type lettuce that we brought. That we have here, and it grows taller, it will grow late uh, taller. Uh, click. L okay. Lettuce, you've got to realize, we plant lettuce, radish, and peas every two weeks to the end of June. Don't plant peas after the end of June. We can plant radish and lettuce every two weeks to the end of July. But if you plant peas after the end of June, they do not mature. You'll get blossoms, but the pods won't come out. So uh, this is peas that you see here on the screen. And they, and and they were planted at the end of April. Yes, and these are flowering. So every two weeks, without fail, we plant our peas because Ivan and I, we love peas in the pod. You know, some people grow the kind of peas that you want to um, to shell and preserve, freeze them. Uh, for us, we love to eat them fresh, so they usually don't even get in the freezer. But uh, my favorite, the, the sweetest, are the little marble, but there are long ones called uh, long arrow or green arrow, and, and they grow a lot of peas in a pot and many on, on each uh, plant. So if you're going to freeze them, get something like that that has many more peas uh, in each pot. Even, even, on, uh, even on this year, we'll be, which is late, we'll be eating peas next week from these peas. By the way, we didn't introduce ourselves. This is my wife, Phyllis, and I'm Ivan Valier, and we just live 10 minutes from here. And by the way, uh, we have handouts we're going to give you later, and our information is on there. So if anybody wanted to email us or, or phone us, uh, our information is on our sheet. And uh, also, if anybody wants to come over and see our garden, you're welcome to do that. Like we say, it's just a few minutes from here. Uh, okay, and then sunflowers is the other thing that we plant at the same time, very early. Uh, they come up so good, and uh, do we plant them for food, honey? Well, no, we don't plant them in the garden, really. We have a little strip alongside the house that I, right out of the kitchen window, and I till that, and she puts these sunflowers in, and in the fall, the blue jays come and sit right alongside that window and eat the sunflowers. So the only reason we, we plant sunflowers is for the, the, blue, blue, the blue jays to eat, and uh, for us to see when we sit eating our breakfast in the morning. Uh, so then uh, there's a second planting uh, of peas. We've already talked about lettuce and radish. Those are the three main things, are they not? That you can plant early. And if, how long can you plant them? Like I said, you, you can plant, you can, yeah. Until the end of, of, of June. Of June, and then, then the, don't plant peas after the end of June. They won't mature. But you, can you still plant radish, radish and lettuce? Radish and lettuce to the end of July. End of July. So those are two different things. Uh, the garlic. Now we want to talk about the garlic. When do you plant that? Garlic uh, traditionally is planted in the fall. Uh, some didn't come up, so we planted some this spring, but you usually plant it in the fall. And what um, comes on the tops of them? Uh, they get nice curls up there, they go to seed. But in case you, you want big garlic, so you cut the curls off. Let the garlic get big. And you, um, we... Um, harvest them, how do you know when to Well, when the tops dry off, it's like an onion. When the tops dry off, then you harvest it and you mm -hmm. store it. Now what about parsnips? Do you dig them <laughs> off at the same time? Parsnips, we'll be talking about that. Um, you know what parsnips are? Parsnips are like big white carrots, and our parsnips, we grow them three or four inches across, and I've measured them 16 inches long sometimes. But they are so sweet. But we don't dig them in the fall. Leave them to the spring. They winter well in the ground, and they're a lot sweeter in the spring. As soon as you can dig them up in the spring, dig them then. And parsnips in the store cost a fortune. You only can get them certain times. They, they sell them like little tiny carrots when you get them in the store most of the time. And if we repeat a little bit, uh, forgive us, 
But when you plant parsnips, um, put a radish seed every five or six inches, parsnip take a long time to germinate, and if you don't do that, you'll forget where the row is, and you might till it up. By the time the radish are about ready to harvest the parsnip up far enough, you can see the row then. Spring, spring, oh yeah. The only thing you plant in the fall is garlic or else this um, Egyptian, Egyptian uh, onion. onion. Can, you can put yeah. them in the fall. They'll come up, they're pre annual, they'll just come up by themselves. So. Every six inches? Yeah. Six so inches. What month for parsnips to plant? Parsnip? With the main crop. The, the, only thing, the only thing that the ones that I said early was the ones you can plant early. Everything else has to be planted after danger of frost. But the exception, well, Actually, cabbage, uh, you can plant cabbage and broccoli. We don't usually, though, because unless you have a hotbed or a greenhouse or someplace, the soil doesn't germinate the stuff fast enough. Most of the stuff we usually plant around the, so about the 24th of May after the frost. If you plant it early in that, even, even if you don't get a frost, the ground is usually so cold yeah. that it doesn't germinate well. But if you've never eaten parsnips and you're going to grow a garden, be yes. sure and grow parsnips. Oh They're goodness. one of the most wonderful. I love them. They're one of my favorite foods, just about next to uh, asparagus. Um, corn, click. <clears throat> uh, this so, is corn. You can see. When do you plant corn? The corn, I plant it. Uh, er, I plant it uh, 24th of May. I usually put in one row. I put in two rows, two or three rows, the next, two week later, every week to the, what, the 24th of June, I put in corn. The first one I put in one row for eating early. I put in one row at the 24th of June, which sometimes I'll get a harvest off and sometimes I won't for eating late, but my main crop is in between that. And usually the corn will be ready about the second week of August and usually I our corn for freezing is usually about the 25th of August. Okay. And is all corn one kind? There's many different varieties of corn. It's popcorn, which we never grown. Our friends used to grow it. This corn you see here is northern, uh, ex extra, 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 extra sweet. sweet. Northern, it, what's it called? Uh, northern extra sweet. Yeah. It's made for the north? It's supposed to mature in 62 days. Now, I'm going to tell you that uh, the seed catalogs tell you the maturity dates on your seeds, but in, but in actual practice, uh, it usually takes longer. That, that's what I found anyway. But there's, there's, there's peaches and cream, there's all kinds of corn, so you'll have to choose what you want to, uh, to grow. Well, I can tell you one thing that I choose. Um, we, we grow very sweet corn, and that's a, a, the sweetest corn you can grow is this northern extra sweet. However, um, it is a little bit tougher to chew, and the peaches and cream is a little more tender to chew. So it depends on, but it's not as sweet. So you can just uh, decide, um, and this is what's so good about getting in the country now, when you've got a little time, you can take a year to decide, okay, I'll do this kind this year, this one next year, and know what one you like the best for the regular uh, long run. Now, there's one thing. This is a hybrid corn. You will not be able to take the kernels and plant them and get a true... Uh, Northern uh, Yes. And do not plant this corn with, with regular corn because you get cross-pollination and neither one will taste good then. Now, so if you, if, you want, if you want to try different kinds, try one one year, one the next, or else separate them a long ways in the garden. We're going to talk more about cross-pollination with other things uh, later on. Yeah. So when you're growing corn, there's something big and black that grows on the top sometimes of one or two of the cobs. What is that? Uh, that's what they call smut. Sometimes it comes on the stalk itself, too. Most of the... T if you buy seeds from a seed company, the seeds will be treated to, uh, to help resist smut and corn borer. But if you, um, it, it's, but this smut, I just break it off and get rid of it because it's, it will, it, it's a big contamination along with the corn borer. The corn borer isn't as bad as the smut because the corn just, borer just bores a hole in the cob. Lots of times just in the top you can break it off or you can cut it out, but the smut, it, it, it's bad. 
and you get more smut in a year like this when it's cold and damp. So now we want to talk about squashes. And we're going to start with the winter squashes. And there are many varieties of winter squash, like um, uh, crookneck or, or um, different... Crookneck's a summer squash. Acorn, okay. Acorn, Acorn is winter butternut. squash. Butternut, that's butternut, the yeah. Butternut. But we grow one great big squash. What do we grow? We call it, we grow the green Hubbard squash. And uh, they probably average us about 20, 25 pounds. And we had one last year at 42. I grew one at 44, but sometimes at 30, but this squash, uh, people come there and you see this, this doesn't look very big yet, but in another four weeks, this plant had grown to a cover about, uh, about a 30 foot radius in every direction. <laughs> and it produced, we had, I don't know, 35 or 40 squash last year, we used about three, but they get big. And people make the mistake when I want to give them a squash, they say they only want a little one. The little ones aren't good because the bigger they get, the longer they've been in the sun and the sweeter they get. And as they get older, the rind gets very thin then. But the rind on these Hubbard squash are very hard. The best way to, uh, we bake them in the oven. We got a wood stove, so we just put, but I take the handsaw, carpenter's handsaw, you cut, you cut lumber with, and you cut the squash in two. Because they're really or, or they're hard. If you try it with a knife, you're going to injure yourself. It's a lot easier with a hand. I keep one special there. We cut them in two. We put them in the oven. We leave the seeds in, unless you want to see, leave some seeds for, um, for next year. But we leave the seeds in when we bake them because then it protects the, the nice uh, yellow meat in there. It doesn't turn black eh, with the baking. So, so then we just keep this, everything out. And we got two or three inches, usually at two or three inches, a nice eating there. Very delicious and sweet. Is that the same thing for butternut and olive? Do you leave the seeds in? Uh, you can. You can. See, here's, here's the thing. When we're growing these things, it's not only for a meal to put it on the table. When we, when we um, cut them and get them in the oven and everything, we are preserving them for the winter. We want to emphasize one thing that everything that grows in the garden, yes, we eat a meal here, we eat a meal there of it, but mostly we are preserving it, freezing it, canning it, whatever, for the winter. And I would like to mention that uh, another reason why the, the largest Hubbard squash are much better than the smaller ones is because the meat inside is much darker. The darker orange or red or, or whatever color it is, the more nutrients it has, more vitamin A. And so you are actually getting more, better nutrients if you can leave it in the sun longer. And the ones that are dark green on the outside are the better, the better ones. The more symmetrical they are, the better. I want to mention this about a Hubbard squash. When we bake it, we have a big old wood range. Uh, when my dad and I carried it in there in 1965, which was... Uh, how long was that? 40, 50 some years. It was an old stove then, but it's still going. Wow. But we bake it for three or four hours, depending on the heat, whether we got a hot fire or not. We usually turn it so it gets baked. But Phyllis then scoops it out and she puts it in, uh, in, in plastic and in, in, in freezer bags, something put it in the freezer, but we don't eat. Now, Hubbard squash will keep, as it is, if you've got a cooler room, it'll keep to probably December in the cooler room. But then after that, it might go bad on you. And I don't harvest the Hubbard squash, because we're going to talk about that later, but... Uh, yeah, that's okay. The Hubbard squash, I usually harvest it. Unless last summer, some of them started going bad because they matured quicker, but usually you harvest them when it starts to freeze before it gets to minus five. You can let the first frost minus one or two. Once the leaves are gone, you better get your squash out because they get no more connect protection. And one more thing I'd like to mention about the, uh, about the freezing of this. We have been through a lot of different things, and this is what we've come down to, that we put it in like a half at a time, or both halves if we can fit them both in the oven. The reason we do this, we used to cut them in smaller pieces. Then, all the way around, each small piece is going to have the blackness from the baking, and you take that off, you're taking a lot of squash off. 
This is also the reason why we leave the seeds in. All the, all the mess that everybody's eager to get rid of as soon as you cut them, right, and when you're preparing them, leave that in to bake it because that way, uh, then when, when it's done baking, you just take all that off, you haven't lost hardly any squash. And so, so uh, it's, it's evolved over some years, our understanding of how to go about this to get the most out of it. Now, if you've got to use gas or electricity to bake this for three or four hours, I don't know how economical it is. But since we heat with wood and we got the stove, we put it in there when it cooled day, and we get this as a free thing. We get a, and we cook on the wood stove. Even in the summertime, we do our canning with the wood stove or wood range and that. And our air conditioning is we open the windows on both sides and <laughs> blows through. So God has blessed us. Now, uh, about summer squashes, the main one that we use uh, is zucchini. What about zucchini? Uh, do you Zuc plant it? You plant it after a danger of frost. I had trouble, we had to plant it twice this year because it was wet and the first ones didn't come up. And, but zucchini usually, if you want the real delicate ones, pick them when they're four to six inches long. And if you want to pick, you can pick and eat the blossoms. The blossoms are worth about seven to eight dollars a piece at the market. Zucchini blossoms. Wow. <laughs> but if you let them grow big, they'll get like baseball bats. You know, they'll get four or five inches and they'll get long. But they'll keep all winter, by the way, if you let them like a baseball bat. But we don't let them go like that. No, so, so zucchini, you can pick it every day. If you want a lot of food for a little space, zucchini will just produce and produce. But I wanted to ask you, do you plant them in rows like you plant everything else? No, squash, like the Hubbard squash, the zucchini, we plant them in what you call hills. It isn't that we, we don't make a big hill, but we make a hollow, but we put five or six or seven or eight seeds all together because often only one or two come up. So it's called a hill when you actually make a hole and put seven seeds in that one hole. Uh, I see lots of people, they do make big hills, but we don't. We just... Uh, I said, if people saw the way we plant a garden, they wonder sometimes how we get anything out of it, because we'll plant this big garden. The main part of it, we'll put it in in three or four hours. All the, a lot of different seeds. But God is always blessed. We always get lots. And, and like I say, our winter squashes also are in what we call hills. Um, it's a row of hills, is how we do it. We might also mention about planting the, uh, the big squash that takes so much room. Where do we plant it? Well, I usually plant it at one end of the garden, and I leave about 30 or 40 feet at the end, but it also can go over the fence, so it goes over the fence and onto the road allowance, and, and you got squash hanging on the fence, and they go everywhere, Clear. through the weeds. When you say a hill, you actually do mean No. No. No, I just, a put, a, I just put a hole. That's we call them hill because, we, yeah. Some people make big hills, but we don't. Excuse me? That's right, five to seven seeds in the little hole. And it's not a really deep hole either. No. Because these seeds, this has amazed me, the, how, how little bit of dirt you put it under, and it germinates in there, and the roots go on down, and the plant goes on up. It just totally, do you know, in the fall, or in the spring rather, we plant a handful of seeds, and we get a truckload of vegetables, or trucks load. Honestly, Ivan has to get the tractor and what else? Do you well, actually, it? since I got a salmon, I got a forklift, so I bring the forklift with a box and I just go there and we put the stuff and we carry it. And our house was built in, in 1904, but when my parents took it over, they, they took out the rest of the basement. We got a walk in cellar from outside, big door, five feet wide, six feet tall, and we could walk in with the, with the produce. And I keep that part, I keep the salmon in the wintertime about plus one or two. It's like a fridge down there. So, so it's amazing how God multiplies. But see, he said, by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. Did he not say that? And see, this is the reason why we have to get the seeds and put them in the ground. God doesn't put them in there for us. And if we miss doing that, we miss all our ground. What is it doing? It's not producing. And then if you have to buy every mouthful of your food at the store, can you imagine how much that would cost? That's why most of what we eat, I say most of what we eat through the year is produced in the garden. 
This is why, do we live on lots of money or the lack? What do you say? <laughs> we live on the lack of expense. Uh, we got 52, 53 acres uh, there. We, we got lots of wood. I got a sawmill, so I don't get enough. There's lots with the sawmill. Um, so we burn wood. We make, make our own maple syrup. We made 337 liters this spring. I, we tapped 400 plus taps, but we'll be talking about that tomorrow if you're here. Uh, my vehicles are all back in the 80s because I got a machine shop and I can bring one of them and work on it for six weeks if I need to rebuild it. So we, we just keep these old things running and uh, the Lord has blessed us because we don't have a lot of expense. We got, a, we got springs there that run over 50 gallons a minute of water. Because when I was watering my logs, I pumped 50 gallons a minute and the river would, the creek would dry up above me but it never dried up below. Even when I was pumping 50 gallons a minute, it was still running below me. So we are we're very really blessed. On your property, if you can, I and, our, our and our soil is sandy loam. It's not this heavy, hard clay. It's not sandy. It's a beautiful soil. It just everything seems to be ideal there, even though it was I, I inherited it, but my parents chose well. Okay, so we're going to continue with the the uh, talk. On the, the, beans. One, the one thing I want to tell you, I can't emphasize. We're going to talk about soil preparation some. The main thing about growing a garden, you've got to keep the weeds out of it somehow. Whether you use mulch or whether you use the hoe, which we'll be talking about, you've got, you got to keep the weeds out. If you don't keep the weeds out, you, your garden will not produce well. Okay. So, and, and talking about that uh, leads us into our next subject, which is about string beans. Now, um, if you have not hardly got any space, can you still grow string beans? Well, this is, we grow bush beans because we like them. They're more tender. Have you ever heard of pole beans? Well, if you get pole beans, you put a pole and you put it as high as you can. I get up on top of step and put them 12 feet and they go up to the top and they'll start coming down. But uh, two or three stalks of pole beans will grow more beans than you can eat all year. They just produce and produce. But the beans are a little bit tougher. And they're really fat. We had, one, we had one lady from a church, she says, I like the pole beans. When I get my teeth in, I know I'm biting something. <laughs> <laughs> they're really long, and they're, really, and they, they're a little tougher. Uh, the, the string is much more pronounced on them, but there's a lot of eating in them. You don't need to have a pole, actually. You can plant them by a wall or something, something they can climb up on, put a piece of chicken netting or something so they have something to climb on. I might add about the squash, too. That they have a squash when it grows, as it grows, as the, the vines grow out, they put roots in the ground as they go too. So they're, they're not only fed from the main stock as they grow bigger, they're fed from all these little roots that come, go in the ground as it grows. And there's a number of plants that do that. If you leave tomatoes laying on the ground, they also put them down, but it's way better to get them up. Anyway, um, we were talking about string beans, and the reason why I much prefer the bush beans to the pole beans is not only because they're more tender, but they come on at one time. And see, for us again, it's to preserve things for the winter. You don't want to preserve one bean now and one bean later. You want to get them together and, and do them. And so over uh, two or three weeks, you're, you're preserving your string beans. Um, Th these beans you see here now, they're, they're in blossom. We'll be getting beans in another couple of weeks, and we'll have beans from them to it freezes. Now, if you want to keep, if you want to keep beans, we preserve them green. If you want to let them mature and get ripe, they get hard, and then you can shell them. They're like uh, your dry beans. dry beans. You can cook them like that in the winter. But okay, we wanted to talk about tomatoes now. Uh, Tomatoes are better not laying all on the ground. So what did you do? Uh, we put, you get these steel cages you drive in. As you can see in the picture, you see the wooden stakes I've driven into the steel cages so that they stay upright. This is our tomatoes that we just put in this spring from plants. And there's green tomatoes on them. Now later on, I think in the next series, we'll show the plants we had last year. They were like that. <laughs> and like that. 
What kind of tomatoes uh, do we put in? Are they all one kind? Uh, no, we usually, I like beef steak, but they don't always mature in this area. So I put in early girls, some early variety. I usually put in two or three different varieties of tomatoes. We do not put in enough for the can. We put in about 16 plants. Our canning tomatoes, we usually go and buy them from one that grows in commercially because unless you want to can tomatoes at uh, one, a few bottles a day, a few dollars to my, we just go and buy four or five bushels and can them at once. Like we can usually do about a, about 80, 80, 80 quarts a day. As both of us work. Both together. of us are. We, we're on the fire. We'll do, eight, we'll do 80 quarts a day, so you get 20 quarts for a bushel, so we'll do three bushels, three or three and a half bushels in a day. So what kind can you put in for eating then, you know? Well, the, the, this is the kind. We when, have mm -hmm. early girl, which, which uh, matures first. There's, the early girl, and there's glamour. They are very nice tomatoes, both of those. And then the beefsteak come on later. And like Ivan said, sometimes the reason we can't get them is because the season is short. They, See, what... Okay. What we're telling you today is for this area, it's for, for uh, what will grow around this area. Uh, yes, if you go f even at Bancroft, they got a two weeks shorter growing season at least. You get more, you go south of here, trying to get on Bellevue, you got another two weeks more. If you notice on the building there, you see it white there, another picture you see. You see it white halfway up. That's where the irrigation hit it last year. It whitened the wall. Because <laughs> remember, last year was a very dry year. But I, like I said, I got lots of water, and I poured the water on it 24 hours, 24 hours once a week, see, all a, summer. Okay. There's another type of tomatoes we didn't mention, and that's cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. Now, those tomatoes, please keep them in another place of your garden, totally different than your regular tomatoes. You don't want them to cross, but bigger than that, you gotta know when these plants are coming up, what you've got. Otherwise, otherwise you could end up, you can't get rid of them once they start because they fall on the ground, you can't pick them off. They're going to fall on the ground, then they're going to spring up the next year, and if you've got them all together with your others, your volunteer plants that come up are good plants, but they are going to get all mixed up. You won't know which is which, whether you've got real tomatoes, like big tomatoes, or just these little ones. They're good, they're sweet, but... Uh, well, well, basically though, uh, even if you've got good plants coming up around Terry and you don't want them, uh, till them up or get rid of them. What they call a weed is a plant out of place, and if you've got some of these plants, even though they're good plants, if they're out of place, and there's too many of them, you just got to get rid of them. That's right. And we wanted to mention about Swiss chard, the reason why we, we have chosen to grow Swiss chard and forget about spinach. What's the reason? Well, the spinach is small and it goes to seeds. A lot of work. The Swiss chard we grow, we'll get two feet, it'll get two, two feet, 30 inches high. It's easy to harvest. It tastes about the same and, it, and it'll go it doesn't go to seed. We get it even after the snow comes. Most of these vegetables, like Swiss chard, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, mm -hmm. uh, Brussels sprouts, we even pick them in December sometimes. But the main thing to do, even lettuce, once it gets froze, we'll have lettuce right to the end of October. All of these vegetables, it'll freeze. If you let it thaw out naturally, wait till it's above freezing, it's totally thawed out, and pick it, it's fine. If you pick it when it's froze, it'll go all watery. Mm. Now, if you, if you take a head of cauliflower and you put it in your freezer at home, it'll be all watery. But when it freezes naturally on the vine, it'll thaw out and it'll keep on growing even wow. after. Because yeah. I picked cauliflower in, in December. One year we had a mild spell and we went the 1st of January and we got some stuff out of the garden. That was very unusual. But. So now I want to mention about, uh, okay, there's a, a question back there. How do we keep the lettuce from going to seed? You don't. That's why you plant every two weeks. That's coming so, to the next so, hour. So, yeah. <laughs> so, that's why you have fresh lettuce. And when it gets too much, I take the tiller, what's left, and, and get rid of it. There's only two or three weeks uh, at the most that the lettuce is at its peak. If you really want lettuce at the very best, you've got to do what we mentioned before, plant it every two weeks. 
and keep doing that all the way through to the end of July. In this area, you can do it till the end of July. You gotta realize though, when you get to October, late September, October, and it's cooler, the lettuce will go for six weeks and it, 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 it grows so slow it doesn't go to seed then. Okay, uh, now we want to mention about beets. There's different kinds of beets and, and which one did we choose? The cylindrical ones? The cylindrical beets, they grow tall, they grow two or three inches big and foot long sometimes. One reason, now you can get the Detroit dark red, they're a round beet, but we like these other ones because they're very sweet for one thing, but you don't have to thin them quite as much. They just spread out and they grow more or less on top of the ground. The and only part that's under the ground is the little root, and the rest is all up on top of the ground. Beets and carrots and turnip take a lot of frost. I never, we never harvest our beets and carrots to the last week of October. So the point here is that you don't have to have enough room. If you have the, the space for round beets, you know how many inches you have to have for each one. Whereas with the cylindrical ones, they grow up long. And so that way you get big beets and, and they can be close to each other. However, as we eat beets through the summer, I try to thin them out. I try to, as we go, as we go so you kind of thin them out so that so as they grow, they get bigger. Now cucumbers is uh, another factor and uh, we have Two kinds that we put in now, we used to put in different kinds. Uh, what kind of cucumbers do we do? Well, we do the pickling one, usually one, one hill. And then we grow the long burpless ones. Cucumber is a, is a plant that you harvest green. Because when cucumbers get ripe, they turn yellow and they're watery and lots of seeds. You've never seen anybody selling ripe cucumbers in the store because they're yellow when they get mature. So you always pick them green. Now you can pick them any size you want. But these burpless ones, these, uh, I, I seen them, I measured them at, I think I measured one there last year, it was at 22 inches or oh, something, yeah, and yeah. two and a half inches, and it was still nice and green firm. Yeah. But, but that, 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 is, that isn't the normal size, you know, we, but that's how big we have got them. And I used to think that to make your dill pickles, you have to have them, uh, you're pickling cucumbers, you have to have them at two inches and that's it. And so I'd be picking them and keeping them in the freeze, in the refrigerator till I had enough to make my pickles. No, you can just go right ahead with these regular English cucumbers or whatever you're growing and cut them into sli slices like um, uh, strips. And that way, put them in their bottles, and they make just as good dill pickles as little tiny pickling cucumbers. So it's, it's so much simpler. We really come down to uh, uh, simplify uh, our garden in that way. Now, we're not talking about uh, canning that much. I will mention this about cucumbers. My mother used to make dill pickle with vinegar, and she did it coal-like, and they kept well. Uh, we're using lemon juice now. My mother tried it with lemon juice and didn't always keep, so what we do now with the lemon juice, we... we, we, we boil we, it 10 minutes. You put it in the sealer, you put it in boiling water for about 10 minutes. It makes them soft, it doesn't change the taste, but you don't have to worry about them spoiling then. Yeah, they're not as crispy as the other kind with the vinegar, but we prefer the lemon. It's a natural thing, it's a food, it's not a waste product like the vinegar is. Quick. So uh, for lettuce, we have to uh, think about transplanting, and this is very important for the lady that asked the question back here. This is the way you're able to keep good lettuce. So tell about transplanting. Well, I think the next picture has transplanting on it, doesn't it? This is the one. The color. Uh, we have in the, in the next but, but, but anyway, the transplant, you, you got to... Uh, you could, actually, this head of lettuce I showed earlier was from this first transplanting we had. You got to put the foot apart, 14 foot. You got to have enough room so they can leaf out and make heads. See, and this is the row of it that it came out of. And the big thing about lettuce is give it some room. If you want to get big lettuce, you got to give it space. Again, don't just make a tiny little garden that's a, a couple of feet. You gotta have some room in the garden for these vegetables. I'm not saying if you got if you if you're in the city you don't have a big area, you grow what you can in that area and you're gonna to have to make it more compact. Uh, but we got the room so we use it. 
So what kind of things do we transplant? There's many things. You, cabbage, red cabbage, early cabbage, late cabbage, the kohlrabi, broccoli, broccoli lettuce, cauliflower, Swiss chard. So, um, we even transplanted some tomato plants that come up from the garbage throughout last year. They come up, they were nice plants, so we saved them when we transplanted them okay, here last year. How do you know when you should transplant something? Well, that's basically when you get what, about two or three leaves on them, they have to be so high. Now, you've got to remember what. Three inches high. Yeah, you've got to have two or three inches, even four inches. Don't worry. Now, when you're transplanting, if, we, if, if, it, if it's raining or, or the ground is going to be wet, that's the idea of time. But if you're transplanting and you don't have the idea of time naturally, try to transplant late in the day and then water it with a hose or the watering can. The, the transplant, as soon as you put them, they'll lay right down. They look like they're dead. Don't worry about it. Don't do anything. Just leave it. Overnight, in the morning, they'll come up overnight water it the next day. You'll have to do that two or three days. It might lay down the next day, but after about the third night, they'll stay up. They'll come up at night. Do you have any questions? Do you want to ask More any questions? questions? Oh, shame. Um, Here's a question right here. Um, how about the, uh, is that, the, you know, the Spanish people in Oshawa? Yes. Last case, way, they've given us 0.6 of an acre so that we can do agriculture. Good. So I'm really wanting to do by the blueprint. Um, some brethren are feeling that, you know, they're doing the no-till method. So we're doing two methods. There's like 20 by 10 feet of no-till. And the other 0.6 of an acre, we're actually, we've actually dug the ground with just a shovel. And we've done like about, um, let's see, 30 furrows on one side, and the furrows are about 12 feet long, and about 15 furrows on the left side. Yeah, same size. And then we've done mounds, which are those with the zucchinis and all that. So I want to know about the no-till method, and then we know what. So the question that's being asked is, there's two different methods. You can do a no-till method, and you can do a till method. And, uh, Basically, we're talking about what we've done through the years. I'm going to say this to you. When I was growing up across the road from us, there was a Dutch family lived there. They just came from Holland. They had seven children. They didn't have a lot of land, but he grew a garden every year, and he turned it all with the spade by hand. He did everything by hand, and he grew a big garden every year. There's the other thing I, was, uh, I wanted to say. Uh, just give me a minute. Yeah, um, the, the, it's yeah okay, there's no tail method. Okay, the strawberries. When we grew strawberries commercially, when the crop was done about this time of the year, we would, we would plow the land, we would uh, disc it, and then my dad would broadcast soybean seeds, and we'd disc it in, and that would come up, and the soybeans would get up about oh, 15, 20 inches. Just before the frost, we'd plow it in and disc it. And uh, after about three or four years of that, we give that piece back to the farmer. The grain would grow two feet higher. You could just see the line down. The grain would be two feet higher, and the corn about four feet higher. The only thing the farmer complained about, he says, if you get a wind, it blows everything down flat. It's so high. But if you want to really build up your land without artificial fertilizer, or barnyard manure or something like we get every year. You put soybeans in and plow them in green. You can probably do two crops. You could probably put one early, plow it in this time, put another one. It will put a lot of nitrogen in your soil and it will build your soil up quickly. And you'll see a big difference in it if you want to do it naturally. So the question uh, about I, I know that I did a garden when my baby was very little, <clears throat> and I used this shovel and did it by hand. And I ended up with, with a tenovitis in both my wrists while I was trying to change baby at the same time I, as I was trying to do my garden. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's a lot of work. In this day and age, we are not the Amish people that believe you can't use machinery, and we we uh, use machinery to, to do it, and there's nothing that we have read anywhere that you shouldn't use any machinery. So um, this is what we feel is, is the wise way to go since we have it. If you don't have it, like you say, uh, your neighbor, uh, do what you can. Well, in those days, there weren't many rototillers. I will say, too, that...
when I grow a garden, I rotate the crops from year to year. I never try to plant the same thing in the same place the second year. It helps keep down some of the parasites that tend to be in one spot. And, and, and some things like corn take a lot out of the soil, where other stuff like squash or lettuce don't take much, so you, you try to rotate it and put it in different places. There's a question. What, what I'm going to say about uh, that, what I said earlier, you've got to control the weeds somehow. Some of this stuff, though, I, I've noticed over the years when they put a lot of this uh, um, mulch or what, after a while it doesn't, it doesn't uh, Does it disintegrate do fast enough, and you've got a garden with mulch in it, too much mulch, not enough soil. I don't know what you have to do then. <laughs> I, personally, I'm saying where we do it, we do it, we just put the stuff in, we hold it or till it that. I'm not saying these other methods aren't good. You'll have to de decide what you want to do. I know some people use mulch, or like, like, like this lady said. I'm not saying they're bad. You're going to you're gonna have to try them for yourself. I, I know, I'm just telling you what we do, and I can, do you want to take I can show you the results, that's all. Is, was there another question before we break? Oh, there's a question of oh. somebody. Who has a question? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just actually was going to make a comment on that. Um, we have to remember that when we did the back to Eden, before we did the above no-till method, he tilled for years. Then he rock-picked, and, and we've done both methods. And I find that you're right, the first year, it's really good. But then you do run into the problem all of a sudden of, um, now I have all this bark mulch on, but the weeds are coming up through it, or they're growing in it. it there's other, and then you have to break it all off. Yeah. To, so we have done it both ways, and I do say that we do need to keep in mind that when he had such great results, he had also rock picked for years, he had also tilled for years, and then he went to that method. Whereas if you go with just the newspaper and doing it that way, I think it's a little bit different than the results that he initially got. Because he had done it. Oh, yeah, he does talk about. There's a lady up there. So. Okay, yeah. there's a question up there. You said to give the lettuce lots of room. Yes. How far apart? Uh, we'll be talking about that next, but. Just enough for the, for the lettuce, how big you want it. If you want it this big, you better put that much yeah, we, 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 we left those heads about yes. four, 12, 14 inches yeah. for that. The rows, we make the rows, we use a rototiller. Some tillers are a lot narrower than others, but we leave it so you got four or five inches on either side of the tiller when you go down the rows. There's a man over here. Yes. Thank you. You didn't mention anything about raised beds. Raised beds. We are not talking about that today because we don't do it that way. We, we, we don't personally do it that way. I see lots of people do it that way. Um, I, I'm not saying anything against it. I'm just saying that we have never done it. We've just planted it. Work up now. If you're going to take a piece of sod like this and put a garden, if you if you plow it, if you plow it in the spring and put your garden in that year, you, it's going to be tough. You probably be best if you could work it one summer ahead and keep working it, or else you're going to have a lot of wheat. Yes, uh, Pam. Like two feet, it looks like you're doing. Yeah, and, and then and then just give them that compost every year. Like if you're in the city and you don't have a lot of space, then those are a good idea. Is that the boxes you're talking about? What 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 I'm saying here, what I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to keep it very simple. Uh, because if you come and you don't have anything, you don't have any money, you don't have the time, you can grow a big garden simply. 
These other ways are good ways, but you want to you want to uh, realize you're going to have to and you're going to have to uh, study it out and develop it so it works. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. One more question, and then we have a break. That's in our next hour. And our next hour. We'll have a break, and then we'll get into. We'll, we'll talk. Break yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.